in the 30 minutes I have remaining to go through all of this. Now, the history of ADHD goes back to the 1700s in Germany in the first medical textbook published, which was by Melchior Adam Weikert, and it contains the first description of people with what today we would call ADHD combined presentation. But even then, uh, now more than 240 to 50 years ago, the first description of this disorder includes descriptions of emotional control problems, and you see them here. And that was followed up by Alexander Crichton's medical textbook, and his chapter on disorders of attention also includes problems with emotion. And then George Still used to be thought to be the founder of ADHD until we discovered Weikert's uh, textbook. George Still, Still thought that emotional problems were the most important component of this disorder, more important than the attentional and the hyperactive components were. Uh, and he referred to this as having the defective moral control over the regulation of behavior and emotion. And what he meant by moral control is what today we would refer to as cognitive control or executive functioning. And that is the willful ability to manage ourselves, to govern ourselves. And throughout the 1900s, through the 1960s, the 1970s, 1975, as you see here, all of the major writers at the time had emotion as one core feature of the disorder. Dennis Cantwell, Paul Wender, Mark Stewart, and others. So what happened? Why isn't emotion considered part of the disorder? Because in 1968, when the first DSM manual was published that included childhood disorders, ADHD, which was then called hyperkinetic reaction of childhood, was included, but emotion was removed. And only the hyperactive, inattentive, and impulsive symptoms were mentioned. And that took over all clinical thinking. And from that point on until about a decade ago, people did not realize that emotional dysregulation was in fact a central part of this disorder, even though it had been there for over 170 years. And that was a big mistake as Wayne mentioned at the beginning. So historically, emotion has always been part of this disorder, even if the DSM didn't acknowledge that. A second line of evidence or reasoning is the neuroanatomy of ADHD. So let's take a look here. This is the neuroanatomy, the neural circuitry of emotion down here. The amygdala and its connections back into our limbic system. This is where emotions are generated. This area here in this sort of orange color is where we attend to these generated emotions, and they may in fact influence what we're thinking about. So how we feel influences what we think, and thinking is going on up here in the general dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, and to some extent in the posterior cortex. And this blue area is responsible for the top-down regulation of these provoked emotions. So there's your circuits. Emotions bubble up, get recognized, may influence what we think about, and at the same time, what we're thinking about can be used to suppress, moderate, and alter emotions. It's a bi-directional street between these two. Now, why is that important? Because all of this is implicated in the neuroanatomy of ADHD. The frontal lobe, the uh, anterior cingulate, the um, uh, ventral striatum, as well as the amygdala are all part of the executive circuitry that has been repeatedly shown to be involved in causing ADHD. So there you have it. The neuroanatomy of ADHD includes the neural circuitry of emotion. So problems with emotion regulation logically have to be part of this disorder, even if the DSM doesn't say so. Now, even neuropsychological theories of 
these brain networks and functions include an emotion regulation circuit. I've already mentioned it to you. Uh, of the three or four major executive circuits, one of which is the working memory or cold cognitive circuit, that's the dorsolateral cortex, going back into the central part of the brain, the striatum. The second is from the dorsolateral cortex through the striatum to the cerebellum, that's the timing circuit, which by the way explains why ADHD is one of the worst disorders you can have when it comes to time management, uh, which is true. Uh, ADHD is devastating with regard to time and time management. Finally, and more to the point of this lecture, one of these four circuits is from the frontal lobe through the midline of the frontal lobe, as I showed you in my past slide, into the amygdala, which is the gateway to the limbic system. This is called the hot circuit. I sometimes call it the Y circuit because it's absolutely crucial for decision-making, as Antonio Damasio argued years ago uh, in his book, Descartes' Error. Uh, so we have in the neuropsychology of ADHD an emotional regulation circuit that's part of our theories of ADHD and its executive function deficits. Again, even though the DSM doesn't include that. And here you can see the four circuits illustrated in a brain diagram. I don't want to spend any more time on that because we've talked about how these are connected with each other already. Uh, but again, to emphasize, one of them is the self-regulation of emotion. And ADHD would be expected to disrupt that substantially. So the next question and line of evidence is, does it? A review of all psychological research on emotion shows that, yes, indeed, it does. For instance, I did a national survey of children and adults from ages 6 through 92 back in around the year 2010. And part of that survey was collecting information on executive functioning, including emotional self-regulation. And of the five dimensions of executive functioning, identified in this rating scale, one of the strongest is self-regulation of emotion. And it also proved to be one of the most impaired dimensions in children and adults with ADHD. And there's abundant psychological research besides my own studies. And I'd simply list them here, not for discussion, but other than to say, that rating scale studies, direct observation studies, studies of children at the preschool level, all the way up through elementary school into adulthood, studies of the psychophysiology of people with ADHD show problems with emotion regulation in the autonomic nervous system. When we look at family genetics, we can see that the genes responsible for ADHD are also the genes responsible for its emotional problems. So it's not like this is something new that I'm adding into ADHD. It's always been there. It's part of the genetics of ADHD. And so people in families that have ADHD family members also have people with emotion regulation problems as well. Longitudinal studies like my own have clearly shown that the emotional problems are highly persistent into adulthood, assuming that the disorder itself is persisting. And studies of adults with ADHD coming to clinics show that to be the case as well. And in both those areas of research, the symptoms of poor emotion regulation are as common as the traditional inattention and verbal impulsive symptoms are of ADHD. So uh, again, it's not like these are lesser symptoms, they're equivalent symptoms in terms of their frequency and importance. Look here, here's a study of children I followed for 25 years into adulthood, and you can't read the legend here, unfortunately, um, but the red is the children whose ADHD persisted into their late 20s. The blue are the children whose ADHD could no longer be formally diagnosed. Some of them had outgrown the disorder, not many, about 14%. Others had a reduction in symptoms so that they no longer met 
the DSM or our research criteria, but they were still highly symptomatic and impaired. So we call those non-persistent. And then here's our control group. And what you don't see over here is I had the prevalence, the percentage of people with ADHD showing these problems. Uh, and the percentages were up around 70 to 85%. So notice that if your ADHD persisted, your emotional control symptoms also persisted. And that's what these bars represent. Impatience, frustration, hostility, easily aroused, excitable, and so on. And here's a graph showing the same kinds of symptoms with adults with ADHD, precisely the same findings. Adults with ADHD have very prevalent emotion regulation problems, and the symptoms are as prevalent as inattention and impulsivity. So again, uh, there's nothing different, nothing new. We're just adding more to our understanding of what ADHD really is. It's not just an attention disorder. Now, putting impulsive emotion and problems with the self-regulation of emotion back into ADHD helps us understand comorbidity. Uh, this is a bit complex, but I'm gonna go through this very quickly. We're gonna use oppositional disorder just as an example, because it is the most common disorder. It's a pattern of hostility, anger, defiance, also low frustration tolerance. It's 11 times more common in ADHD, often arising within two years after the onset of ADHD. ODD is known to consist of two symptom dimensions. One, emotion dysregulation, that's the anger. The other, social conflict, that's the arguing, that's the refusal. And it turns out that both of those dimensions contribute to the risk for later disorders. The emotional dimension contributes to the risk for anxiety and depression by adolescents and going forward into adulthood. Indeed, the longer ADHD goes untreated and these emotions remain dysregulated, the greater the odds that these disorders will develop, particularly anxiety disorders, which is why only about 15 to 20% of children may have an anxiety disorder if they have ADHD, but the figure rises to 45 to 50% of adults with ADHD coming into clinics. Now, the social component of ODD predicts later conduct disorder and antisocial behavior. And that's because the social component of ODD is learned while the emotional component of ODD arises biologically from ADHD. ADHD creates one of the two dimensions involved in ODD. So if you're diagnosed with ADHD, you are one big step down the road to having ODD. All you have to do is get a little training within your family with regard to learning how to coerce people using negative emotions, and you will pick up the social conflict symptoms. This helps us to understand very clearly why emotion uh, and ODD are managed so well by ADHD medications but only if ADHD is there. If ODD is by itself, that's not true. Now, I did mention that parenting is also part of contributing to ODD the way parents handle child misbehavior. But the starting point, which is important to this lecture, is the emotion dysregulation caused by ADHD. And you can see that here, where we have ODD is first caused by a child's problems with emotion regulation arising from either ADHD or possibly a mood disorder. And then adding to that is the parenting component. And that also is going to contribute to the social component. Put those two together, you get a defiant child. Now, there are other components to this theory of ODD. Time doesn't permit me to go through all of these components. I wish I could get this to advance. There we go. Okay, it doesn't seem to want to activate very well, probably because I'm going way too quickly here. I can see that my time is passing. So let's get through that and just understand it doesn't seem to want to move. <laughs> Lily, I don't know if you can get this thing to move on. There we go. Okay. Uh, the other point I want to make is that putting emotion back in ADHD predicts a variety of impairments 
that are not predicted by inattention or by hyperactive impulsive behavior. Look at this long list of things that the emotion dysregulation uniquely predicts in the lives of people with ADHD, from social rejection to road rage, to intimate partner difficulties and even violence, uh, to problems with later alcohol abuse, risk for PTSD, occupational functioning, dating, uh, use of credit and impulsive buying. I mean, look at all of that. That's what emotions, when they're not properly regulated, are doing to the lives of people with ADHD. And that's just a short sample. There are clearly additional problems that are linked to the emotion regulation one as well. But I think the point's been made.